Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. I'm having problems too with the slides. So there we go. Okay. They uh, told me it was easy. It is easy. <laughs> it's never easy. Hey, um, this gentleman to my right, I just want to take a moment, introduce him to you. He's our guest speaker today. Um, we go back years now. Over 20. About 20 years. Uh, last week I preached on Ephesians and we're working our way through that little book of the Bible. But uh, I did allude last week to spiritual fathers. Bob, I can tell you that he has been a, like a spiritual father to me. And Bob Rowley um, has been serving as our district superintendent for our denomination for about 20 plus years now? Mm -hmm. 20 plus years? And then you've been pastoring for how many years on top of that? Since 83, almost 40. 40 years. And, and Bob was my pastor in Laredo. Sometimes I share my Laredo stories and I was a youth pastor and Bob was my pastor and and Bob actually has um, really been a spiritual father to our denomination and has coached and mentored um, a lot of different pastors and I'm one of those recipients so he is retiring from his position as district superintendent and he is going around churches and what we call a farewell tour and he's just preaching a farewell message and I know um, we would not be here if it wasn't for the Lord using this man in my life. I know I wouldn't be here if the Lord wasn't using you in my life. So I just wanted to just thank you, and I got you a gift. Um, you are from Philadelphia, is that correct? We don't tell everybody in Texas that, but yeah. <laughs> and I am a Cowboys fan, sad enough. Yeah. So, Bob, uh, I remember one time you... you you showed a picture, and I don't, I don't have the quote, but you, you have the quote, but Tom Landry, and Tom Landry has this famous quote about, what does it say about coaching? Remember that quote? How to get players to do what they normally can't do. Yeah, let's Something see like that. how that one goes. Getting people to do what they don't want to do in order to become what they want to become. Uh, and so that's Tom Landry's philosophy as a coach. But all, I bring all that because I got you a gift, Bob. That's and, when the Cowboys used to win, by the way. So, <laughs> so yes. And so if you don't mind, would you just open that gift before you open up the word this morning so I can uh, give you six feet? <laughs> yeah. Knowing James, there's probably some humor here, right? So here we go. Um, I figured you're going to have a little bit more time now. You could be there praying. We are, yeah. Praying for the Dallas Cowboys to go back to the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, anyways, today this is Dr. Bob Rowley, and let me just pray a blessing over you, Father. Thank you for my brother, my my spiritual father, my mentor. And I just pray that he would continue to use the work that you've begun in him, Lord, for generations to come. Thank you, Lord, that we are a recipient of of your grace, and thank you for the work that you've done in him. Bless his wife, his children, and all his grandchildren. And I even pray for the next generation, for his great-grandchildren. Just be a blessing for generations to come. Amen. Thank you, James. Well, good morning, Vista. Uh, Joanne and I are thrilled to be with you here this morning. And uh, we go back with James and Elizabeth, as we've said, for a couple of decades here. So uh, a lot of years together. So um, appreciate being here. And... Um, 
we brought James on as a student ministry pastor, youth pastor back in the day in Laredo, and then James, Elizabeth, and Joanne and I had a number of years in ministry together there. We saw God do amazing things just like he's doing here. We saw lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus, right? People who once were far from God became close to God, and they entered into that relationship with Jesus as their Savior, and he changed their life for all eternity. And that's that's why we're here today, right? I mean, that's what this is all about as the church. And um, so we had a great time there together, and then the church sent James out to finish up his uh, master's degree at Dallas Seminary, and then on to Wayside for an internship, and then to plant Vista Community Church, and the church in Laredo was able to partner with him uh, with that, and then he left, and then I left, and then the church doubled, and uh, and so uh, when he and I were there, the church was about 370, and then um, Chad McCartney was on our staff, and he took over, and the church went to 750, and then Chad left, and now the church is a 1,000, and they're about to occupy a brand new uh, sanctuary on a new campus for Easter Sunday, and they, they launched a Spanish language service, and that's really going well, and, and so it's just amazing what can really start small. Joanne and I started with um, six adults. And, um, you know, one of them didn't know the Lord. He became the first convert uh, at his kitchen table. Uh, and, uh, and so God is good. And um, what God is doing here with James and Elizabeth, uh, we're seeing the same thing here. And uh, it's all about transformation and lives changing. And so we appreciate the support. It is a farewell tour. So we appreciate all of your financial support, your prayer support for the district. We have about 80 churches, about 20 of those are church plants. We appreciate Elizabeth, and she's led um, breakout sessions for pastor wives for us at district conferences over the years, and James coaches church planners and helps them and serves on partner advisory teams and has been on our board of directors, so we appreciate the close contact with Vista with our district. Um, but this morning, I'd like to talk about Jesus. He's always a good subject to talk about, right? And I want to talk about paradigms and how we view things and how we, we see things. And so, I'm supposed to hit that, and there it is. It worked for me, so that's great. So, um, a paradigm is one that serves as a model or a pattern. Um, it's this set of assumptions. It's, it's uh, concepts, values, practices the way that we would view reality and how you view reality isn't the same as maybe the person next to you and some of you are married and learned that really early right um, so uh, you know according to the dictionary it's um, a pattern a framework now um, to help you understand this the question is how old is this woman how old is this woman on this slide and um, the answer really depends on your paradigm. Um, some of you see uh, an elderly woman, a senior saint, as we uh, heard John say. Um, some of you see a young woman. Some of you see a young woman and an old woman. If you don't see any woman, I can't help you today. But um, but there really are two, two women there. The old woman's mouth is the young woman's um, necklace and the old woman's nose is the young woman's chin now they uh, they asked me in the slide r room this morning like hey you know there's this blank slide and i'm like there really is because if they haven't found that second woman they're not going to give up they're just going to keep on looking and they're not going to hear anything else so so we're going to get rid of that but you know you can google it when you get home uh two women in a picture you know or something on on google and you'll you'll find it um, you know, you and I develop certain ways of looking at things, and churches develop certain ways of looking at things. Back in the 1950s, 1960s, I mean, you went to Sunday school, and when Sunday school was over, you went to the worship service, and when the worship service was over, you came back for Sunday night church, and on Wednesday, you came for the prayer meeting, and like, that was the paradigm back then, but paradigms shift, paradigms change. Um, culture changes. The Bible doesn't change. The gospel doesn't change. But um, how we do church can change. And so now churches pretty much have 
Sunday morning worship and small groups, whether they call them growth groups, life groups, whatever kind of groups. But that's pretty much the paradigm we're seeing today with churches. Used to be churches had an organ and a piano. Now we see a drum set and keyboards and guitarists and it's just a different paradigm. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's just a different way of viewing how we're going to worship God and lead God's people in worship. Um, when we went to Laredo in 1983, I took out an ad for the church in the Yellow Pages. And there are some people in this room that are like, what are Yellow Pages, right? They've, they've never seen Yellow Pages. And of course, now it's the web presence and social media and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, this morning there are pastors that, that don't have a Bible with them, but they have an iPad or they have their smartphone and it had, has the Bible on it. And they can even advance the slides from it just like this iPad. It's just amazing how smart these devices are. And um, it's interesting when, when James became our youth pastor down in Laredo, I had a couple of daughters still at home and, and Mary was the youngest. And, um, you know, James, she's 37 now, my friend. So that means you've grown a couple of years, too, and aged there along the way. But now it's interesting because the 37-year-old, you know, some years ago, I gave her the Bible app for her phone and said, hey, you know, you can just have it on your phone. But she can't make the paradigm shift. She just can't do it. So this morning she's at church. She's carrying that big Bible, and she just can't make the shift um, to looking in church on her phone. Um, I can. I only bring the Bible when I'm speaking from it. Otherwise, why carry it? It's on my phone, and the phone is smart, and it's memorized numerous translations, so we're doing, we're doing well. Um, you know, one of my side jobs is I get to serve as an adjunct professor at Dallas Seminary and teach seminary students about church. So I want to share some of the paradigm shifts that I'm seeing uh, in the church today across North America. So, um, the first one here is this one from an attractional only model to attractional and incarnational so what do i mean by that well you know it used to be if you build it they will come so we're going to have this nice building and we're going to have great program we're going to have killer children's ministry we're going to have really good coffee like you guys have really good coffee i appreciate that as a coffee drinker um you know so good worship good preaching comfortable seats i mean look at those seats you guys are not sitting on metal folding chairs right i mean these are nice seats there's a lot to attract people here and there's nothing wrong with that it's just that in today's paradigm younger folks even older folks don't want only to be attractive they want to be incarnational they want to be jesus to people around them people at work people in their neighborhood and uh, and we're just seeing that change they want to be the hands and feet of jesus um, next one here from spectator to participant and we see this with mission trips back in the day you know 50 years ago the expectation was that people would pray and write checks, pray and write checks. That's not the paradigm today. The paradigm today is we want to go. We want to be out there on the mission field. We want to be involved in seeing people's lives change to the glory of God. Um, we see it with um, people baptizing. So back in the day, the only one who could have baptized someone would have been Pastor James because he's the pastor. Well, now um, I, I was... Um, I was with a fellow in Dallas on Thursday and we were talking about one of our pastors and he said you know his wife baptized my daughter well that's what we're seeing you know this gal leads this gal to faith in Christ she baptizes her a dad baptizes his son it's a different paradigm nothing wrong nothing right it's just different it's a different way of looking at things who can baptize and we're seeing churches that are really involved with the local school districts with mentoring students we're seeing a, a real um, shift with foster parents and supporting foster parents and that is a different you know paradigm today so jesus i think was a paradigm shift for the religious leaders of his day I mean, he didn't come up through their ranks. He was a carpenter's son. He was from Nazareth. 
I mean, it was just really different. And it was really hard for those religious leaders to embrace a paradigm shift. And, and many of them missed it. So if you have your Bible on your smartphone or if you carried it today, which is certainly fine, um, turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 5 here, starting out. So Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And we see Jesus is going to do something amazing by the time we get through these 12 verses. When he, Jesus, had come back to Capernaum several days afterwards, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So let's set the scene. Jesus, if we were to go back into chapter 1, he had been off ministering in Galilee. Um, he's healed many, including a, a demonized man. He delivered him from being demonized. He even healed a leper. And when you do those kinds of things, you can really attract crowds. I mean, he was really attracting crowds, doing that kind of stuff. And so there's all these people. So Jesus kind of, you know, takes a break here. And now he returns home to his base of operations in Capernaum. We don't know this for sure, but he's probably staying at Peter's house. And so this house that he's in is probably Peter's house. Uh, a big crowd gathers in the house. If we were to go over to Luke's account of this same miracle, um, he says, hey, you know, Pharisees came and, and teachers of the law, and um, they came from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And we could just imagine these religious leaders that were really considering Jesus suspect and really didn't like him just waiting for him to trip up kind of like a political debate you know everyone's waiting for the opponent to just make one mistake so we can pounce on that and that's all people are going to hear in the media and um, now this would have been a small house maybe there are 50 people there but at any way even though not every church formally has its residence in a fire hall like you guys we know that this was way way over the fire marshal's limit okay so um, you know this this is really really a big crowd and um, Jesus is teaching he's speaking the word and then in verses 3 and 4 they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men being unable to get to him because of the crowd they removed the roof above him and when they had dug an opening they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So what do we have? We have four men. They bring a fifth man. He's paralyzed. They can't get in the building, so they literally unroof the roof made of clay, dirt, branches spread over beams, um, and, and they lower him. And, you know, just imagine, I mean, Jesus is speaking the word to them, and, and all eyes are on him, and then all of a sudden there's this stuff, like, starting to fall from the, the roof, and, I mean, it's falling on people. I mean, imagine Peter, it's his house probably, right? So, you know, he wasn't exactly the most laid-back, quiet person, right? And, um, and so they lower him, and then there's eight eyeballs just looking down at Jesus. They don't say a word, according to the text. They just lower this guy on ropes. He's now down on the floor, and eight eyeballs looking down at Jesus. And so, you know, what's the expectation here? Well, the expectation, of course, is that Jesus would heal this paralyzed man. But that's not what he does at first. Look at verse 5. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, it had to take faith on the part of the four men to bring this guy to Jesus to heal him. That took faith. And we know from other passages of Scripture that the paralytic must have had faith because Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And, and you know, Jesus only forgives sins when we put our faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. Great faith seems to unleash God's power, right? 
I mean, it took faith for you guys to come out here. I, I remember so many conversations with the elders and with Pastor James, and this was a big move. It was a scary move. And, and we're going to build this building, and we're going to take on this debt. Um, but great faith seems to unleash God's power. And, and hey, it's in the room this morning, and uh, this is only a portion of Vista Community Church with Omicron and all that good stuff, right? So thank you for your faith um, in advancing the gospel out here. And there's a lot more homes going to be built out here, and you're going to be at the perfect place for people. So that's going to be great. So verse 6, But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they got the second part right. Only God can forgive sins. They got the first part wrong. Um, he's not blaspheming because, as we know, Jesus is God. But they couldn't make that paradigm shift. They couldn't understand that the Messiah of Israel had finally come. And so, um, they're just really struggling here. Verse 8, Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Now, I don't know. I mean, you would think that this would have clued them in. Right? I mean, he's telling them what they're reasoning about in their hearts. You know, there's, we don't know that there's anything out loud here. And he's telling them this. I mean, you think that would clue them in that, hey, this guy has some really, you know, some you know, amazing power here to be able to do all this but but they don't so jesus um verse nine well okay which is easier to say to the paralytic your sins are forgiven or to say to him get up and pick up your pallet and walk and obviously it's it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because who would know you know your sins are forgiven are they who knows but when you have a paralyzed person that can't walk and jesus says get up pick up your pallet and go home either he gets up or he does not get up and so that's the much more difficult thing and that's exactly what jesus is going to do here so verse 10 but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic i say to you get up pick up your pallet and go home and he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went on it out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying we have never seen anything like this um, literally the text says they were out of their minds they couldn't believe this I mean they had just witnessed I mean it's it's an intimate setting they're in this small house and Jesus performs this amazing miracle and of course he still performs amazing miracles today and hopefully he's performed a miracle in your life as you've trusted him for salvation but it's it's just amazing now i spoke earlier about paradigm shifts in the church today and um, i realized i haven't been advancing these verses so there we go there's that one we'll put that one on for you um but here here's one more i want to share with you and this is a biggie we don't just go to church. We are the church. Say that with me. You ready? Here we go. We don't just go to church. We are the church. Um, this is a gigantic paradigm shift sweeping across churches today. People are realizing church is not a building where I come and sit on Sunday morning. A church facility is a building where I come and sit on Sunday morning. But the church... It's people, not the steeple, right? And, and so we are the church, and that's a major change that we're seeing. And, um, you know, we need to be the church for people all around us that are heading for a Christless eternity in hell. And so, you know, on the larger level, we're seeing churches involved in the public school, having mentoring in the public school. We're seeing churches being mentioned on school websites. I mean, it's, it's amazing. We, we see 
them helping with school events, serving teachers. They, we see churches involved in community food ministries, helping the community because they want to be out there on mission with Jesus, on mission for Jesus, because they are the church. They don't just go to church. They are the church. And, and as a district, we equip and encourage our churches to bring about the transformation of individuals through Christ. And, and we want to see life change in individuals and communities through Jesus. Um, so uh, at our district conference two years ago, the board of directors said, hey, we're doing this succession plan, and over the next year we're going to um, get the profile. Uh, we're going to figure out the plan. How are we going to do this succession with Bob retiring? And then what's the profile of what his successor should look like? So last year they did that, and then this year the plan was to do a search and find that individual. And that's all happened, and his name is Dr. Brent Burkhart. Um, he planted a church 20 years ago uh, down in the Houston area, and uh, he's done really well. And uh, just a short side story, his mother and father planted the church where my wife Joanne came to faith in Christ in Cherry Hill, New Jersey and where I later came to faith in Christ. So what are the odds of that, right? It's just an amazing story. Um, and, and I didn't even know that all the years I was there. But anyway, uh, Brent and I have been on the road meeting with all of our pastors. So a week ago we were in Tulsa, and then this past week, uh, Tuesday we were in Houston, Wednesday was San Antonio, Austin, Thursday was Dallas. Uh, but at the, at the Tulsa visit, one of the pastors there, we had all of our Oklahoma pastors, one of them was Philip Abode. And, and Philip is ministering and has planted a church in North Tulsa. And uh, North Tulsa is the poorer end of Tulsa, not the more wealthy end of Tulsa. And it's just an amazing ministry. Um, he, they really are transforming the community. They have crossover medical services. For every one doctor in North Tulsa, there's 27 in South Tulsa. So it's not that people don't have money or insurance, it's that there's no doctors. So they have a medical clinic and now people have good medical care. They have uh, several boys football teams. They have a, a, an academy, a school. They're building into kids' lives, trying to give them a different future. And, and so it's just amazing. They're rehabbing homes. They have all these nonprofits. And you go through this Hawthorne community, and you look at this one church and the impact they're having. It's like, gosh, if every church in America could do this, we'd be living in a different nation. I mean, it's unbelievable. But that's an extreme example of people being on mission with Jesus and for Jesus. So we don't just go to church we are the church and that's what we want to be and there's this paradigm shift and most people are catching it but not everybody catches it and in the churches that don't i mean hey that church that was planted back in cherry hill new jersey they were still wearing choir robes and they still had the mindset we're here and if people want to come they can come they didn't understand that they needed to be the church they thought this was the church the building and uh, yeah, they closed several years ago because they were doing church like 1960. It was great for 1960, it's just that it's not 1960 anymore. Fortunately, they planted Cherry Hill Chinese Church and now that church occupies their campus there. So um, there's this great shift and paradigm shift. And you know, the, the paralytic's friend, his need moved these guys that they were going to get him to Jesus. And they, they couldn't get through the door. They couldn't get through the window. So they get up on the roof. They tear apart the roof. They lower him down. There is nothing that is going to stop them from getting their friend to Jesus. And, um, you know, they, they were on a mission. And it, it kind of sounds a little bit like the mission of your church, right? I looked on your website. To follow Jesus and help others do the same. That's your mission to follow Jesus and help others do the same. And, and so my encouragement this morning is be the church. Don't just come to church. You need to be the church. You need to come to faith in Christ, and you need to go out and help others come to faith in Christ as well. Now, if all you do is come here on Sunday morning, 
I'd say that's low risk. Let me show you. We're going to take a little survey, and I want you to be honest here, and there's no shame in this, folks. There's just no shame, okay? How many of you have ever been in an automobile accident on your way to church? Would you raise your hand, please? Are there any hands in the room? You've been in an automobile accident. We got one. We got one. Okay. So, I mean, hey, it's really low risk. It, it could happen. It could be dangerous next Sunday if you come here. I mean, you could be in an accident. It, it, it happens. Living proof over there. He'll remain nameless. But um, I was in a church one time, and I asked this, and like three or four hands went up. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to let them get out of the parking lot first, right? But um, <clears throat> if we are out there on mission with Jesus, being the church, it's risky. It's messy, right? You're putting it out there. You know, we worry about rejection enters my heart. You know, we worry about we reject it. You know, well, what if we reach out to our neighbors and they don't want to be our neighbors anymore type of thing? Hey, let them move. No, um, you know, they, you know, we, we have to reach out because that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us out there. He doesn't want, just want us in here. You know, we come here to, you know, worship and get fueled up. But the ministry of Vista Community Church doesn't take place here. It's out there. The other six days of the week. So I just want to encourage you with that. We don't just go to church. We are the church. So, you know, the impossible happened that day. A, uh, a guy that could not walk suddenly was able to pick up his pallet and, and walk. Because we serve a God that can do those types of miracles. And he's still doing miracles today. The impossible is still happening. People far from God, heading for a Christless eternity in hell, are still coming to Jesus. Who doesn't want us to just go to church. He wants us to be the church. So, what would it look like for you to be the church at work, at school, in your neighborhood, with your extended family. What's that like to be the church? And maybe that's how you're living. And if that's how you're living your life, wow, kudos. I applaud you. Uh, you challenge all of us. That's great. Keep it up. But if that's not how you're living, hey, it's time to step up. <laughs> you know, we need to raise the bar. Um, you need to get busy for Jesus in terms of your time and your talent and your treasure and, and, and make those changes to be the church because that's what Jesus wants for all of us he wants us to be the church don't just go to church be the church so you know some lessons we got these four guys and they were determined they were determined to bring their friend to Jesus and you know we need to have that same determination we're God's plan A there is no plan B we're it and God would like to use each and every one of us and then there's that paralytic guy, and I mean, he's paralyzed. He cannot get to Jesus on his own. And men and women, every one of us, we're surrounded by people who need some help coming to Jesus. And Jesus would like you to be the helper because you don't just go to church. You are the church. It is a paradigm shift. And, you know, I just want to beat it into you today in a loving, kind, nice way. But, you know, you need to get it. You don't just come here and sit and soak. That's not church. You are the church. And the future is amazing for this church. I don't know what you're going to do with all the people, Pastor James, Pastor John. I mean, you know, go back to multiple services, plant more churches, build bigger buildings. I mean, they're coming. And if you can grasp the idea that we are the church. I'm on mission. You know, remember the old Blues Brothers movie? On a mission for Jesus, you know, on a mission from God. If, if you're on mission for Jesus and with Jesus, he's going to use you to do amazing things. And then, of course, we got the four men. We had the paralyzed man. We had Jesus, who is our awesome God, amazing God. And he wants to use each and every one of us. So one last time, say this with me. We don't just go to church. We are the church. Let's pray together. Lord, um, I've watched this church from before it was born for your glory. I've watched it 
in a coffee shop. I've watched it in school buildings. I've watched it in a fire hall and, and then um, this campus. And you're just getting started. And so, Lord, thanks for the incredible, wonderful ministry that you build up here. Thanks for the incredible foundation that's been laid that can be built on. And, and we just um, look forward to you living out Ephesians 3 and doing exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or imagine according to the power that works within all of these people. Lord, as they don't just go to church, but they are the church, your church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to let them change the slides here, I think, from the back. They can do that. And I'm going to exit with my new cowboy shirt, so I'm quite happy. Yeah.